happening now. We'd like to welcome our viewers from across North America and around the world. Welcome to the EdTech Situation Room, episode 60 for August the 9th, 2017. My name is Wes Fryer and joined uh, joining you as has normally been the case, although I guess not met last week, from Oklahoma City where we've had some delightfully uh, relatively cool weather. It was like in the 80s, low 90s today. Um, but I'm going to guess the fires are still burning in Montana for my regular co-host, Jason Neifer. How are you today, Jason? Are you having to wear a mask when you go outside? Uh, it's not quite wearing a mask weather here, but the fires are pretty significant and um, everyone's calling it the worst fire season um, in recent memory. And Missoula, uh, which is where I'm at, but by the way, Jason Neifer, I am the assistant director of the Montana Digital Academy and I reside in Missoula, Montana, which is in western Montana. But uh, uh, tomorrow will be the, uh, if, assuming we get no rain tonight, tomorrow will be the uh, record of all times so we'll be keeping records of the longest amount of time without uh, rain in in or rain or moisture in Missoula. So um, most of Western Montana is on fire in one some way, shape, or form. And Sealy Lake, which is located about an hour northeast of Missoula, Sealy Lake tonight announced that the air quality there is unsafe for anyone, um, which is pretty significantly bad. And they're advising that if you have to work there for some reason, you need to get out of town to sleep at night so you're not exposed to that terrible air 24 hours a day. So it's uh, it's a significant problem here. And we've had some pretty bad uh, uh, summer fire seasons the last decade. And this one is, is kind of taking the cake. So um, yep, thick smoke and a lot of haze. Man, that is crazy. That is crazy. Well, um, when we were, let's see, in California for spring break last year, that was, you know, the banner year of snow, uh, nine feet of snow by the, you know, in the sequoias where we were and uh, six feet still on the ground. And Colorado had a banner year for snow. So I guess it's just, you know, the extremes of climate change. Oh, my wife is down here saying she's been paused. Honey, allow me to unpause. Well, are you not gonna be able to tether? I am tethering, I'm trying to send an email. Okay, you can, <laughs> but you're not tethered. You just have to go up and connect to your phone. <laughs> So, what is causing Wes's family to give him really dirty looks? It's called Circle Go, ladies and gentlemen, and what I have done um, prior to the start of tonight's call, because as you know, we have had a few bandwidth challenges from time to time. Uh, actually, we both, we both kind of have. It hadn't just been one-sided, but I think I've probably had more. Uh, the Circle Go device <laughs> lets me press the pause button, and I took... Uh, this laptop is my wife's laptop and ma and moved it to be unmanaged. And um, so then I, I paused the internet for everybody else in my family. So we had announced the show was starting, but this just ensures everyone is off. And I'm going to use my iPad uh, to, you know, look, look at the show notes. And so I forgot to take it off. So as soon as I got online with it, it said, looks like this device is paused. So I feel like I have actually taken control of my home internet tonight. So yay, much to the chagrin of others that do not want to be moderated or limited in any way in their connectivity. So Jason, for, uh, if anybody is a guest, uh, what's the elevator spiel for the EdTech Situation Room, why we're here, what we do? And by the well, way, um, we have the largest microphone uh, west of the Mississippi River. Too. I, I do, I do. It's the um, it's the Blue Yeti, which is my favorite microphone because it feels very powerful. And I've got it on my kind of semi-professional stand too. So um, the EdTech Situation Room is a weekly-ish podcast where Wes and I take a look at headlines from across the technology sphere and apply them um, to an educational uh, uh, infrastructure and, and, and environment. And in other words, we like to keep an eye on what's going on in the technology world and see if there's a um, an educational focus that we can um, spend some time on to try to give insight to those that may be interested on, on how technology evolution is impacting classrooms. And so Wes, where would you like to start us tonight? I see we, we brought some links that we didn't get to last week. And then of course the news marches on. So a lot of interesting things going on in the technology news. 
We did. Well, and, and everybody can uh, go to edtechsr.com slash links and access these. And I see we do have a live viewer. Um, I need to get my window open here, but we do have the chat room for YouTube. And we invite you to say hello and chime in with your own, your own questions. Um, I think... I, I don't know. Let's start with the podcasting patent. Um, so this is Ars Technica from August 7th. Podcasting patent is totally dead, appeals court rules. And I must say, as a podcaster, I am I'm glad to hear this. Not that I really thought I was going to you know, have somebody file a lawsuit, but basically the case here is a fellow tried to launch podcasting before podcasting became big, I guess actually you know, got a patent. Um, but it's in, you know, been going after folks and we've heard of probably, you might've heard about patent trolls and people who are, you know, trying, who, who buy up patents and then, you know, go off trying to sue folks. And he got some settlements that evidently were fairly, fairly significant, but it's just ridiculous, right? I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, any other kind of open standard thing saying, you know, you, you can't make a phone call without paying me money. And obviously things are, are patented, but, um, you know, I didn't lose a lot of sleep over this, but is this something that you had heard about, Jason, and, and heard any discussion about previously? And any thoughts? I had that? this particular um, uh, patent fight was covered pretty frequently on uh, this week in tech, the Twit Network at twit.tv, and they have a variety of technology uh, podcasts that are kind of uh, what I would call hard tech as opposed to kind of tech application like ours. And I believe that at one point um, they were either included in one of the lawsuits or they were at least threatened by the patent holder, which is a company um, that's called Personalized Audio. No, I'm sorry, Personal Audio. And they claimed that before there was ever really um, an, an internet uh, that was delivering audio, that they had uh, come up with the idea of kind of packaged up yeah, content. You. Um, that could be utilized and sent via, um, I think it was audio tapes then, um, and that, that the essential process that they were, were, were utilizing is, is somewhat what, what podcast delivery looks like today. And I know that I believe that Twit joined up with other larger podcast networks at the time, and podcasting actually has come a long way um, since this uh, lawsuit was initially filed. Or, I'm sorry, uh, letters of demand were sent to, um, to podcasters asking for fees um, and the person that went to fight against that was kind of early popular podcaster Adam Carolla, who um, put together a, a large fund from other podcasters kind of in defense of podcasting as a uh, as an art that is not covered uh, by these particular patents. Um, I was never worried about it myself, having done some podcast-like projects, but um, it does highlight, I think, a real problem when it comes to technology and software patents, which is what uh, this was uh, considered to be one of. And uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, pieces of information about that. And if you are interested in patenting as a, or software patents and, and the patent process um, as an issue, the Planet Money podcast on this, which I think is like four or five years old now, does an excellent job of going through this process in detail and talking about why these are filed in Texas and all sorts of interesting things about so-called uh, patent trolls. But I am glad that we will not face any legal scrutiny um, for our weekly podcast, despite its millions of listeners, um, um, you know, we're uh, glad that we don't have to put up with the legal scrutiny. Absolutely. All right. What would you like to go to next? Well, um, a lot of interesting stories um, uh, this week related to, I would say, gender. And so maybe I'll get started on, on a pleasant one first. Um, the Verge reports on July 25th that the Girl Scouts have added some new badges, um, including robotics, coding and race car design um, of all things. And there are 23 new badges that the Girl Scouts now offer as part of their badging program. And they are almost uh, completely dominated by um, kind of tech topics, STEM topics, if you will, including a mechanical engineering badge, an outdoor STEM badge, a computer science badge, which is called Think Like a Programmer, um, an engineering badge, um, and then some ones that are more traditional to the Girl Scouts, like outdoor journey and uh, troop camping. But the important piece here is that the Girl Scouts continues to be a leader in, in uh, trying to provide girls access to content, um, to give them the possibility of the world in regards to uh, future vocation and careers. And I think it's a wonderful thing that the Girl Scouts is, are, is continuing to evolve and embrace STEM careers and providing um, girls of all ages access to that particular content. And I imagine, uh, Wes, as a father of daughters, 
you know, you would uh, both keep an eye on this sort of thing, but then agree with the kind of evolution of this process. Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, on a personal note, when I went back in the classroom after my doctorate and taught STEM for fourth and fifth grade, the teacher who I replaced had actually been hired by the, um, I didn't realize my microphone was all the way over there, um, had been hired by the Girl Scouts of Western Oklahoma to be their STEM coordinator. And so they have a, had a special grant at the time, I think with Oklahoma State, perhaps and some other universities, uh, and he was putting together kits and then doing training for Girl Scout leaders to uh, lead in STEM activities. And so, yeah, I think it is fantastic and would encourage folks to reach out, find out what your local um, Girl Scout organization might be doing. Perhaps they have a, a group similar to what we have had here in Oklahoma City where there are kits to check out and even, you know, workshops to go to. Um, he was really into, you know, liquid nitrogen fun stuff and making root beer and, you know, doing different kinds of kind of kitchen chemistry sorts of things. Uh, so, you know, different Girl Scout uh, troops could come and participate in those activities. The leaders didn't necessarily have to learn how to do that and get everything together, but it was an equipping thing where they were, you know, putting them together so that they could check them out and, and, uh, and introduce girl, girls to those concepts. So I'll also say that um, the whole thing of, with badging is really uh, a potentially powerful thing. Um, especially, I, th I think, for making learning visible. Um, this summer, I did a lot of experimenting with a website called Badge List, e -A -D -G -E -L -I -S -T com, <clears throat> And I actually ended up creating with my wife an iPad Media Camp Badge List group, um, which has supporting skills, so about 12 things that you need to know how to do with your iPad, and then about the same number of projects. And then just last week, I was up in Burlington, Vermont, uh, doing some uh, workshops for the Create, Make, and Learn conference, and I started a show with media uh, badge group. And so it's completely free. It's open. Folks can, um, you know, create their own badges. You can copy. If you, if you want to have a private badge or, or, or uh, I guess, group, that's when you pay. But if you don't or, or you just keep it open, it's all free and you can copy badges from one to another and it's a, a pretty exciting ecosystem. And so then you decide what evidence that people submit to, um, you know, demonstrate that they have mastered that skill or fulfilled, you know, the requirements that you specify. And so some different people have signed up and submitted their screenshots and, you know, links and things like that. Uh, one of the things I've wanted to do for a long time and have worked on is, you know, encouraging folks to share things openly and then also just have more examples to go to, to look at. Um, so those are a few thoughts. I think it is good stuff. Excellent. And then maybe let's look at another side of, of, of a similar coin. You want to start uh, uh, talk about the big Google manifesto controversy, Wes? Sure. So I dropped a couple links in here, um, a Bloomberg article from August 7th or no, August 8th. Um, that's titled Demore went from intern to pariah in Google tenure ended by memo. And then a really good response by a recently departed Googler who I guess wouldn't have maybe been able to respond with such candor. Was he still working for the company? Um, and his Twitter handle is Yontan Zunger and it's titled so about this Googler's manifesto. And basically we had a, memo that a Googler wrote that went viral uh, after it was leaked, where he was contending that basically uh, women and um, other ethnic group folks who are not white and male um, were just not as uh, well predisposed, I guess, to be able to be coding. And it was um, trying to justify why we they shouldn't have, you know, any kind of, uh, of, a, of um, I don't know if it's actually affirmative action, but why, why they shouldn't be having their eye towards equity issues when it comes to hiring and, and teams. And so particularly this article, so about this Googler's manifesto, you know, points out that almost everything that this guy wrote was wrong. You know, I love uh, a quotation that he has in there about, you know, how much of coding is problem solving, teamwork, collaboration, working with people, testing. It's essential that, teams have, you know, diverse perspectives and experiences and that that skill set is, it's, it's just a lot more than coding, you know, and sort of sitting by yourself or in a more closed environment and, uh, 
you know, develop, developing code. So uh, this, this led to quite a bit of hoopla, and I've, I've seen it on, um, in fact, even um, the news, what is it? Um, it's not Bloomberg. Um, the Apple TV app that, that um, I, I like, which I'm not thinking of right now and I'll, I'll come up with. But anyway, just tonight they were having an article about it as well. So this is, this is something that's pushed into the, the mainstream media as well. So how, how did you hear about this first? Did you read about it on a blog or, or did you see it, the video? Or Yeah, it, it came over um, as uh, something that I, a couple of things I follow on Facebook that focus on, on uh, uh, women's issues and feminism. And what's interesting to me about this is that there's this perception um, by the author of the the manifesto that somehow Google is 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 focusing too much on diversity when interestingly enough Google is facing criticism from uh, the federal government about its pay practices and pay equity um, inside the company and I think that kind of highlights how difficult um, you know this transition has been for 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 Silicon Valley companies. Um, that are attempting to kind of right in some historical wrongs here in regards to gender imbalance um, in, in technical fields. And, you know, uh, it's probably pretty regularly shared if you're a social media user and your social media feed that there was a very long time where women were becoming an increasing part of the technology industry and coders and engineers. Um, uh, NASA was pretty famous for having a lot of folks that um, uh, were outside of the kind of working scientific norm and invited women and minorities into um, uh, uh, positions of, of engineering and management, um, uh, especially um, after um, uh, women and, and uh, persons of color kind of moved into those positions in a, um, a, a very aggressive way in an attempt to find more quality at NASA. And NASA began to adopt rules to evolve their process um, to, to become a more diversified workforce and reported um, for decades after that, that was a positive evolution there. And then somehow in the early 1980s, the number of women going and, and getting advanced degrees or college degrees in technical fields like computer engineering dropped dramatically. And so um, that uh, uh, stage that we are at, especially with the number of jobs in computer science fields continuing to explode despite an ebb and flow of technology industries, makes these stories um, you know, that much more poignant. And I thought it was interesting in the same week that we're talking about um, you know, the Girl Scouts evolving their programming to involve more STEM content for girls that, that there is still obviously um, a lot of work to do in the industries that many of those girls will, will end up in. So I guess I would say the fight continues, but it is important for us as educators to understand how this process is working and also be both observers and participants as our industries become more 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 gender inclusive and and, and attempt to find some sort of, of of diversity balance in the industry so that all voices can be heard and so we can all work together for the betterment of our culture and world. Well well stated. I want to do a shout out to Olin College um, at the Create Make and Learn Institute, which I think this was the fourth year of up in uh, Burlington, Vermont. Um, Many, many uh, folks very passionate and interested in, you know, gender equity issues when it comes to STEM and STEAM and maker education. And um, they have a great um, coding camp for, for girls in, uh, I think it's in northeastern Vermont. Um, uh, Lucy, who's tech savvy girl on Twitter, actually did her master's thesis on this and then has been doing it, you know, for, for uh, I think almost two decades, uh, for quite a while. And um, anyway, one of, one of the conversations that I had at the conference when we were talking about coding, I was telling the story of our daughter who is now a rising eighth grader and how hesitant she was to get into the computer class, which involved some coding. They were doing Minecraft turtles and really just kind of some basic, you know, block-based stuff. Um, this year, I think, I'm excited. She'll be doing some Lego robotics. Uh, but, you know, there's only one other girl who was registered for this class, and it and the social aspect of this was really, really important as far as getting her in. So I'm, as a parent, getting a little bit more insight into that. And But the other thought that I have is it's there is certainly a lot of work to be done about stereotypes and perceptions of, uh, you know, folks in school, in society, but it's also important to look at what we do and what is the curriculum. You know, when we were visiting schools for our son, who is now about, about in fact, Friday, taken back to Colorado to start his, his second year as an engineering student at Colorado School of Mines, you know, the most cutting edge schools we visited 
were, were talking about how they were doing engineering differently. And they were not simply asking kids to sign up for three and a half years of abstraction filled courses so that at the last semester of their, of their undergraduate experience, they could suddenly have a design class and build something and make things and do hands on. Uh, I'm thinking about Northwestern in Chicago, um, where, you know, the very first semester they're doing that, Alexander in his program had a design class where he was paired with different, different students and they were uh, working to find out engineering approaches to solve the urban uh, food desert issue as far as not having maybe as many fresh fruits and vegetables and higher quality groceries, you know, in some urban areas. Um, but I think that's really important. And so I mentioned to one of the women there at this conference about Olin College. Have you, have you heard of Olin before, Jason? Familiar with it? We, we, I have, yes. We visited it. It's in, I think, Needham, Massachusetts. It's just uh, outside of Boston. And it was redesigned from the ground up uh, as an exclusively undergraduate, you know, engineering focused school. Very unique because it is, uh, you know, 50% women, 50% men. And uh, like at, at Alexander's uh, school, I want to say maybe they're only about 30% women in a predominantly, you know, engineering focused college. So it was almost a religious experience, um, a spiritual experience visiting the school, hearing the, the presentation and their passion for, you know, how important the STEM fields are, how critical it is that we have uh, diverse representation within the STEM fields, but how we need to do things differently and not just, you know, say, well, here, you're just going to have to you know, take these standard old, you know, abstract math, you know, series of courses. Um, but, you know, they were designing projects. They have, they have uh, area fourth graders come in and actually review these, um, these games uh, that the, the students design in their, in their freshman year. And so they've got the real world critiquers, you know, coming in. Um, but it's just, you know, change is hard, right? It's hard to change schools and it's hard to change uh, our mindsets about what the track is and what everybody has to do. So it's great to see the Girl Scouts doing this. I'd love to see more conversations in, in schools about, you know, the, the requirements of what we have to do and the ways in which we're demonstrating our knowledge and the, and the ways in which things can be done in an interdisciplinary way where we are meaningfully creating things and solving problems and making stuff, you know, because that's what the maker movement and the STEM and STEAM movements are all about. So I think that's a very good bandwagon to be on. And Peggy has dropped the link into the chat. It is www.olin.edu. And uh, Peggy says she knows it as well. It is, it's phenomenal. Um, I don't think either of our daughters will probably be bound for that track based upon things they're passionate about and interested in now. But if you know anyone who is possibly interested in any kind of, of engineering, computer science, um, sort of track, it's a school to let them know about. And one other college uh, that we should give a shout out to while we're talking about this topic is Harvey Mudd College, which is actually one of the first uh, institutions that called to my attention the, the kind of changing ways that uh, colleges and universities are uh, approaching computer science in order to make it um, you know, kind of less dominated by one gender um, and, 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 and one ethnic background. And in this particular case, Harvey Mudd College has had so much success that uh, the percentage of their graduates uh, in 2016 uh, that were female was above 50%, which means that they've essentially become a, an equal program. And they've did it in, in a number of different ways, um, including uh, focusing more on teaching over research for the faculty, trying to find more gender balance in faculty. And then they've also changed the way they've approached the content as well, in that you know the first course you take, which is oftentimes a computer science 101 or a coding course, they decided to move against that because it wasn't getting the interest that they were hoping from a, a wide variety of students, whether they want to be a CS major or not. And instead, they uh, focused on projects um, and um, a problem solving and um, kind of computer science as a means of thinking and processing data as opposed to just coding. Um, and, and in fact, in some cases, uh, became a detractor to their more traditional computer science students. And so they had to figure out a way to also placate those students as well to encourage them to continue on with the process. And since that time, they've had, they've gone from having well under 10% um, 
uh, graduating students in computer science being female to now, again, almost 50%. And it's been a kind of evolving process. But, you know, that it just proves that you, know, you put thought and energy and get everyone in the room to talk about it through things, you can move through challenges. And the Harvey Mudd College experiment, I think, is another laudable experiment to try to kind of break up the, the homogeneity, uh, homogeneity of um, the, co the computer science and computer engineering field. Amen. Well said. Okay. Um, should we go to something nerdy next? Yeah. Uh, let's talk passwords a little bit. I just okay, dropped this on the, from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is August 7th, 2017. The man who wrote these password rules has a, no, has a new tip, uh, never mind, which is uh, spelled with cryptic, cryptic characters. And I think we mentioned this previously uh, and, and I'm trying to think of the organization that it, that had made the recommendations, but this is this is dramatic change in in the recommendations that folks that are the professionals when it comes to security and passwords are making. And what they're saying is you should not require folks to change their passwords constantly. It is actually you know counterproductive, and um, you know it it, it does not. Um, it, it does not succeed in, in what we want to do, which is, you know, make, make, for, make folks safer. So, um, you know, we are using two-step verification uh, on, ev on every site that we can. Personally, you know, at school, we're requiring everybody by December to be using two-step on their Google accounts. And, and then we're doing individual ca uh, coaching sessions with, with teachers now, getting everybody set up with a password manager um, so that, you know, we're, we're using different passwords on different sites. And, and the message we're, sh we're sharing is it's more important that the password, you know, have more characters and be different than, you know, it, the, the types of characters and things like that. I want to also apologize. I don't, I, of course, well, I do not like paywalls. And I just noticed that uh, linking from our show notes, you know, it's trying to get you to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. When I originally saw this, I'd actually linked to it from Twitter. And so um, I think that's you know some kind of a of a geeky thing where if you're sh if a, if a subscriber is sharing the link you know it gives a little special code in there where you're able to see it. So I had I had scanned the whole article, but I'm unfortunately not able to link to the whole thing. So I apologize that that is a paywalled article, which we typically don't do. Um, but I mean this this really isn't anything new, I guess, from what we've talked about before, is it? NIST is what it references, because um, he was the author of the NIST special publication um, 800-63, which was considered to be the Bible, as it were, for, um, I think you're muted, Jason. Yeah, there you go. I am. And, um, well, and, you know, big picture, um, security is a big deal, and it keeps getting kind of more and more interesting as things play out. And, in fact, I'm going to share with you um, at the end today in our Geeks of the Week, uh, a brand new podcast by McAfee on, on security called the Hackable Podcast. We can talk about it then. But, um, you know, I think it's important to inform yourself of this, not in a panicked way. And yes, there are big risks here that we need to be made aware of. But there's, um, you know, a lot, lot at stake here in security pieces. And I think that in addition to, you know, our own uh, security procedures, I'm hoping that vendors can start to create um, new and interesting ways for us to authenticate as well. I think that biometrics has a lot of potential for this. Um, fingerprints um, um, are, are obviously now very popular on phones as a um, unlocking means, but I think anything along those lines, including you know eyeball scans and um, my Surface laptop has, or I'm sorry, my Surface Book, or no, my Microsoft Surface Book has a um, facial recognition feature on there that's that's utterly amazing um, because I don't even have to look that closely at it. I can just kind of swing my face towards it, the laptop and it recognizes me every time. Um, that kind of stuff I think is going to be really important. Um, and hopefully technology can evolve to a point to where passwords at some point are not completely out of the realm. I think they're always going to be part of our security strategy. Uh, at least for the foreseeable future, but then we can have other ways to be able to make it convenient to have a very secure device. Well, the article that is just a, a couple above that in our show notes, um, Hacking of School District's Twitter Account is Cautionary Tale by TC Palm on uh, August the 4th, 2017. It's a, uh, a Palm, Palm Beach, Florida area school. 
uh, the, the article basically, and it's a video of the superintendent talking about how hard it was for them to get their Twitter account, to regain at control over their Twitter account. Um, somebody, I think it was a bit of an exaggeration or extreme. I mean, he, he said they should be charged with a hate crime, but were very racist things that they were posting on the school district's Twitter account. And, you know, they discovered there's not a, a bunch, there's not a, you know, high rise building filled with people waiting to answer your phone call, you know, as soon as you call Twitter, it's a, it's a, a algorithmic based process where you're submitting things and you're, you know, reporting, and then it takes a while for something to, to happen and change on your account. So it was a very embarrassing thing for the school district. And I haven't heard a follow up. I mean, this was, was August 4th. So it was about five days ago, but yeah, having a really secure password and making sure it's not a password used somewhere else and that the folks who are handling that for your district, you know, PR communications, or, or maybe you're the person that does that for technology and for your classroom too, right? Yourself personally. Um, I have two steps turned on on my Twitter account and I um, probably, and this is just a little trigger for myself. I, I think I probably need to ask our, our folks at our school if they've turned on two-step on our primary accounts because lots of things can be embarrassing, but losing control over your own social media websites and, and having really offensive stuff being published out and not being able to do anything about it or, or, or not being able to do it for a while I'm sure is quite painful. So have you heard of any local stories there in Montana of that happening, Jason, or any tech directors, you know, talking any stories about that? Um, no, uh, not, not specifically. Um, although in reading this article from the, the, the uh, TC Palm, um, it's not entirely clear to me what happened because it sounds like they, they actually had um, what they called extensive cybersecurity protocols in place, but they had no control over the problem. The district account was not compromised or hacked. It came through Twitter itself and compromised our account. The challenge was getting through to someone at the Twitter organization to take it down. We had no control over the problem. Wow. That's, I mean, that's, that's pretty vague, right? Like, so it one doesn't know. Like an API or something, right? Maybe yeah. they had something authorized because yeah. they're saying that they still could log into their account. So that's another really important thing on a security standpoint. It's probably something to remind folks. Um, I know you've reminded people multiple times, Jason, about their Google accounts and looking at history, what Google yeah. knows and all the things that you've granted permission for. I don't know that we've gone in depth. I think we had a, had an article probably a few weeks ago about OAuth, O-A-T-H. I've listened on the Security, um, Security Now podcast, which is part of the Twit network, where they've discussed potential vulnerabilities there. Uh, we have just implemented some single sign-on um, stuff with our ticketing solution that we use at school and and that really has some advantages but you know we probably all click the user agreement without you know hardly a scan and an actual you know honest to goodness read of, of what the details are and and we need to be careful about that one of the high profile things that happened and it wasn't something I think that led to a lot of malicious problems but if you remember when the Pokemon Go phenomenon happened where the, a year ago or whatever, <clears throat> the folks that wrote that, uh, when you signed in with Google, actually had like total complete access to your Google account to, you know, delete things and edit things as well as read things. And it's really important to look at who you're granting access to. I know that I am more wary today when I'm granting access to my contacts um, because, you know, once those contacts are out there, talk about meta information and things like that. I mean, I think I have a few thousand in my address book. Um, those are things to, to watch out for. So this might be something good for us to follow up on and see what, what they report, if they do report on what exactly happened. To my ear, it sounds like, you know, it could have been something where they authorized an application or a website to have access to their Twitter account, and then perhaps somebody had that kind of access and then was able to post things. So that would explain why they might not have, have actually had, had their, their email. But uh, again, I don't know. I mean, those are, if you have access to your account, you can go in and take a look at the applications that have access, and that would be one of the first things I would do would be to shut all those off so that if somebody is using a rogue API or something like that, they wouldn't be able to. Pretty wild. 
You're pretty interesting. And I think you're right, Wes, about what, what might have caused that. That sounds like a pretty plausible scenario. But, you know, um, you know, if you're using a school Twitter account and the password is on a sticky note on your monitor, um, you know, uh, a tweeter beware, I guess, is probably the best way to put that. Yeah, and be aware, this is a, a, one of the little stories that we've been telling our teachers this summer as we've had these coaching sessions about two-step security and passwords is that hackers and, and script kiddies, those that are maybe not full-blown, I wrote out, write all the code myself, but people that can download malicious scripts have access to things that will enable them to scan hundreds if not thousands of different websites and, and, and if they've got this email with this password, hey, I wonder, you know, what other sites they've used it on. And I don't know what this percentage is. This would be a good thing to find about what Pew Internet or somebody else has done research-wise. But I'm going to guess that over 50% of people today um, have used or do use uh, the same password on multiple sites. I just, I think that's a fairly common thing. And so it's a reason not to do that because if that password is out there and it's associated with your email address, then, you know, there's, there's, tools that people are gonna have on an automated basis to try and, and see if that works. There is one other article uh, that, that mentions passwords, and this was a little older. This is from May of 2014, so it's a three-year-old article, <clears throat> but it's called, it's, the title is The Cobra Effect That Is Disabling Paste on Password Fields, and this is by Troy Hunt. And I'll say I have not run into this that much, but what he's talking about here is when you can't copy and paste a, a password and how terrible that is if you're using a password manager because I'm now using mostly 30 character passwords on different sites that, that are random and you know there's no way I want to ever type that and so when I run into a website that's not going to allow the paste supposedly the idea was I think to make sure you know your password and you're having to type it in twice and not just pasting in something that's in, you know, that you don't know. It, it has a typo in it, I guess, and that you just paste it in twice. But um, that was a good article. And again, I'll, I'll give a shout out to the Security Now podcast. And I'll do one other shout out. This isn't a geek of the week, <clears throat> but I, I've mentioned this before on the show. One of my favorite podcasts to listen to on pretty much a weekly basis is called The Committed. Uh, their their uh, Twitter handle is just Committed Show, and in their latest episode, 180, um, they did a really nice interview with a fellow named Joe Nash that's with a group called Yoti, Y-O-T-I. I'll put this in the show notes. Yoti is Get Yoti um, on Twitter, and, and their byline says, your digital identity app, the easiest, most secure way to prove your identity online and in person. And so what they're looking at doing is using, as you mentioned, Jason, biometrics. And so a scan of your face, but also your voice as you say some random words. And, you know, initially you can use your phone number. This hasn't actually gone live. It's about, it, they're, they're, they're in a, I guess, a beta version. And they're about to uh, announce in a, in a few months, I think. But it's this idea of how do you prove yourself and do you really want to show your ID card or your passport, you know, when you're trying to get into uh, a nightclub or somewhere that's going to require that, you know, that kind of identification, there are other ways to do this. So I think this is really fascinating. Um, the issue of identity is very important in terms of, um, you know, who people truly are. Uh, I think on this podcast, I think it was on this when they mentioned the term catfishing, you know, which is, something that's happening online where people are using pictures of other people that they're, they're pretending to be, uh, you know, at, on dating sites and things like that. And they end up trying to extort or get money from that person. Maybe not extortion, but they feel sorry for them. Anyway, identity, who are you? You know, how do you prove who you are? And uh, I'll just, on the last topic here, say as the, the father of two teen daughters that, no, I didn't pause the internet. Um, boy, it is a different world for dating. And it is, um, you know, helping to try to prepare them to make good choices as they do have lots of interactions with people they've never met face to face. And they're interacting with digitally who may or may not be who they appear to be. Um, boy, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging landscape. And I know some older folks that have... Um, because of circumstances, you know, gone back into the dating scene later in life 
they found social media to be wonderful because they can, you know, vet folks a lot quicker and all this. So anyway, I, th I think this whole whole thing about digital digital identity and, and how it crosses over to security is, is pretty important. And these are things to talk about with our kids, you know, with digital citizenship sites. But, you know, certainly, I think I'll say this, it's certainly not adequate to say never talk to strangers online. And literally, that's what the, the district prosecuting attorney, you know, came to our school and said last year. And my thought was, that's not going to work for my girls. They're already, you know, interacting with many people that they've not met before. They need to know how to do that safely and what right. their boundaries are. You know, just just saying never do it is it's like too late for that. Yep, absolutely. So. OK, well, um, this one uh, could have been a headline, actually, but I don't think it's going to be that controversial. Um, the journal Nature reported on July 25th that a new study proves that the digital native is a myth. And there's an excellent um, uh, article from the um, uh, Teacher Education Journal um, uh, in, in, in recent weeks. Um, and two researchers do um, uh, make the claim that the longtime uh, kind of uh, Mark Prinsky uh, claim that students were different, or I'm sorry, kids were different than adults, and that somehow they were digital natives, and 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 we are digital immigrants, is uh, you know based on science not true. Um, and the I will say that that uh, full disclosure, I've been ranting against digital native uh, dichotomies for 15 years um, for for a couple of different reasons. First, because my own experience um, seemed to to show otherwise, but more importantly. I always found it kind of a, a weird construct because I guess I would never tell a room full of smart, um, uh, uh, hardworking teachers that, that they are, they're never going to understand, you know, how technology can change the world as much as a kid can because they have either blinders on or are unable to kind of process how technology works when I know so many amazing teachers that defy what I would refer to now as a stereotype. Um, about um, adults versus kids, but I have not had the opportunity to look much beyond the first couple paragraphs of the study, although I've downloaded a copy um, of the PDF to read um, when I have a spare moment, but um, there has been several studies in the last seven or eight years that have gone through both meta studies that look at other studies from the past 25 years related to um, technology ability of those that are younger versus those that are older, and then some recent studies that look at it in a number of different ways. But um, Wes, uh, where are you on this issue in 2017? Well, I definitely agree that on the skill basis, you know, we know that kids don't just come out of the womb today um, with, with technology skills. We had a, a situation last year at our school where, um, you know, kindergartners and, and pre-Kers had really not ever touched a mouse and so they were in the library where we <laughs> got some computers that had mice and they were like what's this you know i mean they were just wanting to like, use the touch screen and so we've had some conversations about you know what do we want to be introducing kids to when and you know what kinds of, of literacy skills are they going to need so i definitely am, am not surprised at all and i'm on that same page saying no it's not that kids know how to do all this or that they are masters of multitasking, because I think that's part of what the article and the, and the research brought up as well, is the myth of multitasking, right? When, when we are interrupted, we actually become less productive, and it is something, it fits into digital citizenship as well. Oh my gosh, we're, we're back into the crazy time right now at school where we've had our new hires come back for orientation this week, and the next week all of our teachers are back. You know, and I'm like, there's a book, I think, called Deep Work that I heard about this summer. And it's like J.K. Rowling and these other authors, you know, go to other places and just are able to focus exclusively on something. It's like the world of IT is so far from that in terms of, you know, the hailstorm of issues and tickets and things like that that we get. But one of the things I do think is, a, is, a, is viable, perhaps, in this whole idea of the digital native is the idea of kids changing. And the idea of our brains changing it. And I will drop this link in. This, this is uh, from the Telegraph on August 7th. Humans will become godlike cyborgs within 200 years. And this is by, maybe we've talked about this guy before, Yuval Noah Harai, a professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And what he's saying is really kind of depressing that the wealthy in our society are going to be able to afford to essentially 
mod themselves with all kinds of, of uh, genomic and prosthetic and other technological, you know, modifications. And this is going to, in, in his view, you know, lead to uh, um, some fundamental differences in, in humanity. I, I do think that our brains are, it's, it goes back to whatever article with, uh, you know, social media and the uh, smartphones like crack. You know, the feedback mechanisms of social media and the ways in which our brains are wanting to be constantly stimulated, you know, I, maybe I need to look for the research basis of that and maybe you've found that and it's, it's there or it's not there. So I think there's a difference when we separate, do the kids have more skills as quote unquote, you know, whatever generation they are, younger generation, you know, but are our brains changing as a result of our continual access to technology into the web, and I think that is probably a yes. Well, and and uh, you know the other piece of this is is that 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 does not mean that you know I would neither that this is some no, This means that you shouldn't be introducing technology. Rather, like you have to plan in skill development and building time into lessons and. You know, you have to things that you know, you may need to be teaching some of this stuff directly, and so learning it ahead of time, or or at least getting a functional knowledge of it, so that you can take some of your more advanced students, and and you along with those students can help teach the rest. I mean, there are some nuances here depending on the, the your your classroom assignment and the content that you're teaching. But you know, I I am glad that that research is kind of uh, uh, now coming to the same conclusion that that I had felt when that. Um, uh, kind of digital native digital immigrant uh, dichotomy was introduced um i think it was back in 2001 when when Prinsky's journal article came out but um you know that that doesn't mean that there is isn't something there we need to be fully mindful of but um interesting article um i'm going to read it in detail and i may kind of report back in a couple of weeks once that becomes um kind of reality sounds good um let's see i'd like to let's talk a, a real quick about self-driving vehicles um, this is an article from last month, July 5th, um, but this is from The Verge. This self-driving truck has no room for a human driver, literally. And we've talked about this. It, it's a bit, bit uh, I don't know if it's scary or not, but it, it uh, I'm, I'm, you know, Tesla, I've been watching some wow. videos of the Model 3 that is coming out, and that's very exciting. This is the consumer level uh, version of the car that Elon Musk has wanted to do for years and you know this the whole thing of self-driving cars I think you're gonna have to pay maybe 8,000 more which is a lot uh, to have the full self-driving functionality in in then that personally owned vehicle um, but you know the march of automation that we continue to talk about um, that's a it's a visual worth looking at if you, if you haven't seen seen that article and uh, Again, I just don't, I don't, don't think we're thinking way, <laughs> we're thinking way too short term at this point, but it just, it may not be that long term in terms of, you know, this, this stuff um, making some changes. So I don't know. I, I, I uh, it would be interesting to hear folks that are in the truck driving business or we have uh, loves is a real popular, um, you know, roadside uh, chain that it's all over the place and it's headquartered here in Oklahoma city. And it'd be interesting to find out if they're making plans, you know, the oil industry, you hear them talking about doing some diversification and trying to, to figure out, you know, how are they going to survive if uh, the utilization of extracted resources on the planet substantially goes down. Um, you have, you know, some countries like, like Qatar and uh, United Arab Emirates, Dubai, places that are, they're, supposedly investing in other kinds of things to try to diversify their economy. I wonder what a company like Loves that is, you know, so focused on providing services for truck drivers and long haul trucking is uh, going to do. Maybe I'll, I'll take that on as a, as a little assignment. I'll have to find out if we've got some connections at school with somebody with the, the Loves Corporation. Because, you know, we're certainly, to my knowledge, not making the changes to, to think about what this means for, for school. Um, I don't think so, but maybe maybe people are. Maybe there are folks in our career tech programs that are that are wrestling with this. Um, but yeah, it's kind of it looks like a, a a big container, like from a container ship, you know, just yeah. put on, put on top of a uh, 
you know, it's it's a creepy it's looking picture. Like it, it looks like like dystopian road to the future. It does, man. And I mean, these things are probably going to be on the road, you know, in the next five to ten years. We're not talking about something that's so futuristic that we're not going to live to see it. Wow. So, all right, there you go. We'll dream, dream about that tonight. Yep. Okay. Well, let me give a kind of final article here, and then we can move into the geeks of the week. Um, oh my gosh! Can, it's nine fifty. I can't believe that. I know. I know. It's uh, we uh, we get involved in these discussions, Wes, and and time flies. So, um, Windows Ten S is now installable on quote existing Windows Ten education devices, and so this is an article from Beta News on August first. And it, it's really interesting. In fact, I've, I've done this. I did create my own Windows 10 S device um, on Sunday night. And essentially what happens is that um, Windows 10 S is really just a scaled back version of Windows uh, 10 Pro, which means that it installs anything really that Windows 10 installs on. The problem is, is that if you have any uh, nuanced drivers um, that are unavailable, um, you know, at standard in the Windows Update system, you can't install them because you can't install external EXE files on Windows 10 S. And so a reminder for those, uh, we covered this earlier this summer, but Microsoft announced um, earlier in the year at an education event in New York City that they were going to offer a new version of Windows 10 referred to as Windows 10 S, which uh, they didn't really discuss what Windows 10 S means. It's, it's a school, I think. But essentially, Essentially, it turns Windows 10 into a Chromebook-like experience, which has a couple of advantages to it. The first one is that you can install software other than the software available in the Windows Store. Um, second, it's extremely easy to set up, and there's a process where you can take a thumb drive and simply put it into um, the USB slot and have the computer set up in minutes as opposed to, and that's that's from scratch, out of the box setup in minutes as opposed to what you have to do now with a Windows box, which is to go through an extensive setup process um, and maybe even reinstall Windows if you have a specialized image that you utilize inside your school or district. And so the process is pretty easy. You take uh, an existing Windows 10 Pro install, and in my case, I put it on a... Um, uh, an old corporate refurb or refurbished um, Lenovo uh, T450, which is a, th a three-year-old 14-inch uh, laptop, um, you know, standard kind of utilitarian uh, Lenovo interface. So it's a ThinkPad um, uh, uh, T450, and I put a fresh install of Windows 10 Pro on there, and then I downloaded a, a, a small applet from a link on that beta news article, and after about an hour of, of installing, restarting, installing, restarting, installing, restarting, I now have a Windows 10 S device that works just fine. Um, of course, I'm limited to just the Edge browser because you can't install any third-party uh, software other than what's in the Windows Store. And at this time, the Windows Store does not include things like alternative browsers. But I will be utilizing that machine in coming weeks to try to determine is the Windows 10 S environment as elegant as the Chrome environment is, in, in, in my opinion. I, I now own a couple of different Chromebooks, including, um, and in addition to that, uh, some devices I've turned into de facto Chromebooks using the cloud ready process. I love the Chrome OS platform. I think it's a very functional way to uh, compute and learn. Um, and I'd like to see if Windows 10 S does the same thing. So if you're interested and have an extra device sitting around that you, you that has Windows 10 on it, you can create your own Windows 10 S uh, device. And I, I have to ask Wes, will you be running to go find an old laptop to install Windows 10 S onto? I, I will not, but I will, <laughs> will disclose that I had a, a nice call, actually, with about, I think, six different Dell reps this week who are reaching out to us. Um, we do have about, you know, over 90% of our teachers on MacBook laptops, but we've got a, a few that are on Windows machines, and then we've got a larger number of folks in our business office and, and assistants and other, you know, support staff that are, are using Windows systems. So I will be waiting for your report, Jason, to hear how it compares, and especially interested in the console aspects of that. Um, I am, and I can do a report maybe on a later show about TabPilot, you know, almost completed with the mobile device management uh, transition to from Meraki in, into TabPilot, and um, I'm liking, you know, some of those features. 
Uh, but uh, my wife, who who is now starting, it was her, today was my our son's last day of work on the grounds crew for our school, and my wife's first day of work reporting for for orientation. Um, we were setting up some iPads for her, and um, I'm liking some of the features. But again, it just I cannot believe how complicated it is to purchase to purchase credit on the Apple Volume Purchase you know store. Wait to receive that. Go to a different website to to download the little you know CSV file. Open it up in a spreadsheet. Copy that link. Paste it over into the volume you know uh, purchase site. You know then purchase the app. Then go back to the mobile manager. You know then wait for the app to add and add it. You know and then finally get the device. It's like ah. So Chrome makes it quite easy when you compare it to that. So hopefully you will have a gloriously easy and seamless experience working with Windows S, and I will be duly motivated to find a unused a box and install it on. But at this point, I'm not waiting with bated breath. <laughs> there you go. Okay, shall we do our Geeks of the Week, sir? Sounds good. Um, I'll go. Mine is uh, Send by Firefox. It is private encrypted file sharing, and I've got a, a link to a little backstory about it. Uh, one of the reasons this caught my eye was for the K-12 online conference that I've been involved with for uh, a number of years. And by the way, Peggy's listening and I've got to send an email so we can, we can have a chat with our organizers about what we might do next year. Um, one of the things that we've run into year after year is how folks can be sending really large files and we've used different things. So this is interesting. It, out, it automatically expires, I think, in 24 hours, no matter whether it's downloaded or not. Um, but, and, they, and they're saying, you know, this isn't things to send, you know, incredibly like if you're going to be put in prison in Bahrain because you're a dissident you know you may not want to trust this but it for for a lot of folks uh, in maybe even sending tax things to your accountant or something like that uh, it is encrypted it is going to expire um, it's going to be you know probably a safer way than a lot of other cloud services to send files and I think a gig I think it's a gigabit or gigabyte a gigabyte limit so haven't tried it yet but the next time I need to send a large file, I will be giving it a try. And you can find it at send.firefox.com. Super duper cool. Okay, my Geek of the Week is uh, the Hackable Podcast by McAfee. It's a new podcast. Its first episode was last week. And um, I, I should also uh, say that I also listen to Security Now on the Twit Network, as does Wes. It's not a weekly listen to me, but I like to check in every couple weeks at least because it's an interesting discussion. What Hackable is, is I would um, argue it's it's like Security Now, but for maybe less geeky people. Um, it can get in the weeds sometimes with Security Now, which is why I like the podcast, and I'm assuming that's why Wes likes the podcast too, because we don't mind sometimes uh, jumping headfirst into, into um, sometimes de dense technical issues. But the McAfee podcast is basically, you know, uh, security, cybersecurity in life. And in fact, their first episode, which is was really brilliantly carried out, um, involves how risky are you by going onto public Wi-Fi, and they take a security specialist from McAfee, go to a coffee shop with the coffee shop's permission, and a part of the show is them trying to find a coffee shop that would give them permission, and, um, you know, spoiler, Starbucks never wants you to come in and hack their customers' uh, uh, devices, but they went in and created what was called a man-in-the-middle attack. You may have heard that term before. They also called it an evil twin attack, but basically they created a Wi-Fi hotspot that was called a, like either like AT&T or Verizon or some cell phone network. And the idea was that uh, a lot of cell phone providers, especially regional cell phone providers, will oftentimes uh, create a network of um, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots across a region so that their customers will go onto that Wi-Fi hotspot and not use mobile data. And so they created one that they knew was popular in the region and it at one point had 16 different individuals that were um, uh, uh, accessing the internet through that hotspot. And they were able to see searches they were doing, videos they were watching, photos that they were downloading. And it talks about how uh, possible something like that is, what the implications to that are, and how to protect yourself. And again, spoiler alert, a VPN service was recommended by the folks at McAfee. But really well done narrative podcast that's technical but also very accessible 
even if you aren't quite sure of the ones and zeros of technology. So that's hackable, um, and it's at securingnow.mcafee.com is the website. That's a, actually a blog that has kind of a similar theme, and they'll be posting podcasts there. I got to tell a quick story. Uh, did you ever play with Fire Sheep when it was available for Firefox, Jason? Did I, I did, actually, in, in Washington, D.C., of all places. But go ahead and describe so this was 2011. I was, no, it might have been 2010. I was a uh, year before I finished my doctorate. So I was down in Denton, Texas. I was able to do some adjuncting at the University of North Texas. And I was, you know, staying, I think, two nights a week at a bed and breakfast. And anyway, <clears throat> I don't remember what place I was going. There's all these great restaurants down there in Denton, right on the square. Uh, and so it was one of, one of these pubs. And this uh, Fire Sheep extension had been released for Firefox. And so the, there, there's Black Cat is this big conference that happens in Las Vegas where, you know, you don't even want to turn on your devices there because, you know, it, you're, you're going to get hacked by all, all of these people. And so in order to demonstrate the vulnerability of non-SSL, which is socket, uh, secure socket layer encrypted um, uh, web, websites, um, this this uh, person developed this Fire Sheep extension, and it was so drop dead easy. Literally, just like you'd install, install another extension for Chrome or Firefox, you just click it, you installed it, and then on the shared access point and router, like you're describing at at Starbucks at this at this pub, you're able to see everybody's traffic, and you're able to actually go into their websites. And so I was able at that time, as I recall, I don't think Facebook had implemented HTTPS. And so I was able to go in as someone else and I did not post things on their site. That was scary, okay? But then WordPress also, many times when you self-host, you don't have HTTPS. And so you're able to be logged in to the admin dashboard and somebody was there working on their WordPress site. And so boom, there, you know, I have admin access to their whole site. That was really a pretty shocking thing. Now, since that time, there've been some really big initiatives, SSL everywhere. And there's been a really push. Google's big on this now, you know, pushing secure socket layer and trying to increase the encryption that's happening on the web. But yeah, that, that, that podcast sounds great. And you know, that, that is even maybe a digital citizenship challenge for, for students to be aware of because having seen and experienced that, I am very aware when I am at a coffee shop, I'm generally yes. going to tether to my phone, not, not even get on their free Wi-Fi. When I'm in an airport, I'm very aware with all these different, you know, free Wi-Fi this, free Wi-Fi that. You know, you could just be a, a hacking traveler and with, with your uh, device, create your own man-in-the-middle attack and then intercept credentials that you could use at that time right. or use later. So that's, those, are, those are things that probably a lot of folks just don't know how easy it is to do and what the repercussions could be for them. And I want to send a message out to uh, tech directors in, in K-12 school districts that if you don't already do this, find a way to offer a VPN service to your teachers that are working with student data outside your wireless or wired network. And I know it's probably expensive and something else to maintain and, and may seem like it's, it's, it's of dubious value, but one of the things that we do in my organization is that uh, the University of Montana does have a VPN available to faculty and staff by request, and um, our director has uh, asked us uh, whenever we are using um, a, a laptop outside of our home or outside of work um, or outside of, of, of our phone when we're tethering to our phone or we have a couple of Wi-Fi hotspots that we have inside the organization. So in other words, if you're anywhere else that you connected it to our university's VPN, if you're dealing with anything related to the Digital Academy because of the amount of student data that we trade in. And um, it's 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 good advice um, uh, that if you are working in any kind of sensitive information, but especially if you're a teacher in a school, you either get a private VPN service or you know, talk to your tech director to see if you can set one up through the school and so I regularly set up on whatever machine I'm on even if I'm just checking email it takes me literally seconds to get connected to the VPN and then I don't have to worry about it and you know I do spend a lot of time in coffee shops and co-working spaces places where um, I'm traveling and I, I you know check into work since I can literally do my job and have done my job you know halfway around the world 
um, that's it's good advice. And if you're not already doing that as regular practice, and Wes has a great great advice if you can tether to your phone, especially if you if you have a data plan that gives you um, liberal access to data for that, great. But um, definitely think about that before you connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot that you don't control. There you go. Your public service announcement from the EdTech Situation Room for tonight. So we do want to encourage everyone to please follow us on Twitter at EdTechSR. We are usually here on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Central, 10, or sorry, yeah, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain. Um, boy, it was a little late to be on the East Coast at 10 p.m. So sometimes when we have guests on the East Coast, we will change our times. And we may send some feelers out to see if some folks want to join us. If you would like to join us, get in touch with us, and we would definitely consider that because we have not had guests on for a while, and we enjoy doing that. So please access all of our show note links at edtechsr.com slash links. We do have a listener survey that we'd love for you to chime in with. Let us know topics or uh, themes that you'd like us to, to take on. We had a special... Um, special episode a couple weeks ago where we looked at net neutrality and I'm sure there's probably some other things that we could could take on along those lines as well. So Jason, um, actually before you tell us where we can find you, uh, what does your schedule look like? Are you going to be able to be sharing some ed tech wisdom with the, um, the conference crowd coming up in the fall at all or, or what, is your, what does your schedule look like? Um, I'm actually pretty open. Um, uh, I, I have some internal projects I'll be working on, um, uh, including finishing up my dissertation, which is uh, slowly and surely heading to the end game. Um, but I do not currently have anything on my calendar uh, conference wise. But um, I, I should say both Wes and I are available uh, for speaking gigs. Uh, uh, speedofcreativity.com, nightfor.com um, uh, for all of your speaking needs. But um, I am looking forward to being done with the doctorate program so I can take on more things. I am actually working, um, it's not a conference, but I am working with a, a, a school in Idaho next week, St. Ignatius uh, uh, School, which is a, a startup uh, private high school, Catholic private high school in Meridian, Idaho. I'll be working with the teachers in their building next week. Very good. And it, actually, I'm a .org, so I didn't register speedofcreativity.com, so it's .org. But yeah, it's close. If you if you put in Westfire, you you will find it. Well, um, the, the main one I've got coming up is gonna, not going to be until the spring. It's Ohio. Um, but they're actually very interested in digital security and digital citizenship, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to that because it's going to, I think, we'll get that finalized here soon, be a keynote on the themes of digital citizenship and, and, and security. So... Shout out to all of those folks in Ohio who might be listening to us. So, Jason, where can folks find you online to get more ed tech goodness and pearls of wisdom? I am on Twitter at TechSavvyTeach. You can also find me on my website, www.nifer.com. And I also write at the Tech Savvy Teacher blog for the Northwest Council for Computer Education, blog.nccee.org, where we post usually once or twice a week, and our most recent release, which was finally released last week, is our brand new Chrome OS list, which is on uh, websites, uh, extensions, and apps that work on Chromebooks that allow you to recreate whatever functionality you had on a laptop or desktop. So that's available at our blog, blog.ncc.org. What about you, Wes? You can find me, and I just realized I've not had my external microphone on the whole time, so there you go. Uh, <laughs> speedofcreativity.org, where you will find some podcasts. Uh, we've been doing a few different things this summer. Um, actually, and I did, I think I misspoke with the date. This Saturday, on, on uh, August the 12th, I will be speaking on, li on Classroom 2.0 Live, uh, sharing a presentation about curiosity and media and creativity in students. But uh, Twitter is really the best place. That is where I am sharing the most. I am W Fryer on Twitter, and we'll generally link to whatever else I happen to, to be sharing there. So we want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight, and thanks to Peggy George, our number one fan. Peggy, we send you our appreciation and thanks for joining us and tuning in. And please do share us with others that you listen to. Hopefully, you can find us wherever. Finer podcasts are curated, and if you have taken the leap into the uh, automated home, whether it's a Echo or a Google Home or anything like that, you know, you, you may be able to say, share wisdom from the EdTech Situation Room, and perhaps our podcast will start to play. But anyway, we wish you well and encourage you to stay savvy and be safe. <laughs>